We're continuing to work with the DFT. In the previous video, we found samples of the Fourier transform of a continuous time signal. In this example, we're going to start off with a really simple discrete time signal, and we're going to find samples of the DTFT of that signal. So here is really what we're working with. Um, this is the example, and we're going to do a lot of it pen and paper here at the start of the video, and then we'll go to MATLAB and we'll examine what happens as we zero pad and do some other interesting operations. Okay, so DFT of a finite length sequence. So the signal we're going to be working with here is the discrete time signal X of K, and X of K is equal to this signal right here. It only has three non-zero values. At time zero, it's equal to three. At time one, it's equal to two. And at time two, it's equal to three. And we are going to find the DFT of X of K. Remember, the DFT is samples of the underlying spectrum. So we know how to do that. We had an equation for this that we derived a few videos ago. The rth sample of the DTFT is given by this equation right here. My signal X of K has n naught equals three samples. So I need to sum up three values for each value of R that I am interested in. Since there are n naught equals three values in the time domain, there are three values that I can get out in the frequency domain. And we can pretty easily do those computations by hand since it's only three values. Since n naught is three, my sampling interval in the frequency domain is always two pi over n naught. So the values that I'll be computing for of the spectrum will be zero times omega naught, one times omega naught, and two times omega naught for the values of r equals zero, one, and two. So let's go ahead and uh, rewrite my summation now that I know what n naught is. Here is, and now that I know what omega naught is, here is the summation that I need to compute. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. For k equals zero, my signal is equal to three, so I have a three right here. And when k is equal to zero, I get a zero there, so it's three e to the zero. Plus, at k equals two, my signal is equal to two, and I have a k equals one here, so I end up with one times all of this. And then the k equals two term looks like that. Again, my signal's back up to three, and I have a two right here, so two times two pi over three is four pi over three. So this right here is my expression for xr. You tell me what r is, I plug in, and I get out a value for that value of xr. So let's go ahead and do that. When r is zero, I replace all these r's with zeros, and I get three plus two plus three is equal to eight. When r is equal to one, I get out three plus this complex number plus this complex number. And if you use MATLAB or use your calculator, you can add that up and you get e to the j pi over three. And then finally, x2, I replace this r and this r with two. And I get three plus this complex number plus this complex number. And again, if you use MATLAB or your calculator and you add up those complex numbers, you get this right here. So by hand, I've easily been able to compute the three values of the DTFT spectrum. And the values are this, this, and this, corresponding to frequencies of omega equals zero, omega equals two pi, and omega equals two times two pi, right? That's how we're sampling in the frequency domain. All right, just for the heck of it, let's go ahead and compute um, the actual DTFT itself. We've computed samples of x of omega. Let's go ahead and actually compute what x of omega is. It's pretty easy to do. Let's, so let's go ahead and do that. This is our definition of the DTFT that we've seen many, many times. For this particular problem, since there's only three non-zero values, that changes my limits from zero to two. And then if I plug into this equation, here is what I get for the DTFT. It's this equation right here, and it's a function of the continuous variable omega. All right. So that is what my DTFT is. And if I want, I can rearrange this just a little bit. I can actually factor things out a little bit nicely. Right, I can bring out an e to the minus j omega, which this has, and this had two of them, if, as long as I put an e to the j omega there, right? When I multiply e to the minus j omega times e to the j omega, I get back to three to where I started. The reason I like this form is look at this. This plus this looks like a cosine, right? So I can kind of turn that into a cosine very nicely and end up with this form right here. 
And this form is much easier to take the magnitude. If I wanted to find the amplitude spectrum of this signal, if I take the magnitude of this quantity, the magnitude of this is just one, and I'm left with just the magnitude of that part right there. So let's go ahead and do that. So the amplitude spectrum means take the magnitude of the whole thing, but that has a magnitude of one, so I'm left with kind of this nice equation for the amplitude spectrum. All right, so that's it for now. On the uh, last chart, we actually computed the three samples of the DTFT. This equation right here is actually the DTFT as a function of the continuous variable capital omega. What we're going to do now is we're going to go to MATLAB and we're actually going to plot this and plot our coefficients and make sure that they line up on each other. And we'll also do a few other interesting games with zero padding and things like that. So let's go to the MATLAB now. All right, so let's go ahead and do the MATLAB portion of the problem now that we've worked through kind of the pen and paper analysis of computing the DFT of this finite length signal. Here is the signal we're going to work with. It's the uh, finite length signal I'm calling F here. It has three values, 3, 2, and 3. And at some point, we'll add on some zeros. But for now, I have the number of zeros set to 0. So let's just go ahead and run this and see what we get. So right now, there are three points in the signal. So I can go ahead and compute the uh, you know, fundamental frequency of this signal pretty easily. It's just 2 pi over n naught. So that is our spacing and frequency domain. And then to compute the DFT, I know that if I have n naught values in time, I'm going to get n naught values in the frequency domain. So I've initialized a vector there to be length 3. And then this double for loop is me just evaluating the DFT equation. For each value of R, I have to loop over every value of the signal and perform this computation right here. Grab the value of the signal times the exponential e to the minus j r omega naught k. So this is just the implementation of the DFT equation. So for the first value of R, I'll add in three values to get a value of 8 for f sub 0. And then for r equals 1, I'll add up three values to get the DFT coefficient f sub 1. And then same thing for r equals 2 to get the DFT coefficient f sub 2. So now what I'm going to go ahead and do is plot the theoretical um, DTFT that we computed just a minute ago by hand. So this was the equation that we had for the discrete time Fourier transform as a function of omega. Now, capital omega is obviously a continuous valued variable. In MATLAB here, I have to make it you know, sampled because um, I can't handle pure continuous valued um, variables in MATLAB. But this right here is a very finely sampled version of the DTFT. The rest of this code is me just plotting the magnitude spectrum of the DTFT and then the absolute value of the DFT coefficient. So let's go ahead and let that plot. We'll see what we see. So here, this red curve right here is the DTFT, and the blue values are the DFT coefficients. And we know that the DFT provides samples of the DTFT. So what we should see are these blue dots right on top of the red curve. And that's exactly what we see. Just right now, what we have is since we only have three values of the DFT, we've only sampled this red curve very sparsely. So there's not a lot of information. We've, we've missed all of this information here because we haven't get, gotten enough samples of the DFT. So what I can do, though, is I can do now what's called zero padding. So now let me go ahead and change num zeros up to 10, and let's rerun this. So now the signal I'm dealing with is practically the same. It still starts off 3, 2, 3, but then it has 10 zeros. So now down here in my computation, I'm now going to get 13 DFT computations. And when I do this for loop, now for each value of R, there's now a total of 13 values of R that I need to compute. I have to sum up 13 values to get each value of R. So this double for loop here where I'm computing the DFT is quite a bit longer. Let's go ahead and let that run. And here's what we see. So now I don't see any change on the underlying red curve. And I won't see any change on that curve because the DTFT of that signal, which has three values, is what it is. However, now that I've zero padded, I have more values on the red curve. That's what zero padding does for me when I do my DFT computation. It gives me more values on this underlying curve. So now these blue dots are starting to resemble this red curve a little bit more. Let me go ahead and crank that up. I don't know. To 100, let's rerun it. You can see what happens. Now we're really starting to fill in on that red curve. 
So that's the end of this uh, MATLAB example. Uh, earlier in the video, we worked through kind of pen and paper computing the DTFT of this three-valued finite length signal. And here in the MATLAB, we've actually you know, coded up the DFT algorithm to compute values on that red curve. And we saw how zero padding could help us get more values in the frequency domain. All right, that's it for now. Thanks for watching.